Hello, welcome to the September 30th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test, make sure everything is coming through as expected. And then uh, we will go ahead and get started. Okay, so my name is Greg Undo. I'm the host of the live stream. Uh, I'm presenting from uh, Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. area in the United States. Uh, if you're watching this live, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you live and where you're from. Um, and how the Hangout works is we could ask questions live in the chat field, or you could submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Uh, and we'll be happy to kind of go through all the questions chronologically. Um, when asking questions, if we could try to remember to include uh, which version of Cubase you're running, whether it's like Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, which level, which version number. So if you're running 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, and which operating system, that information is helpful. Um, all of the topics covered in today's live stream will be indexed with timestamps and pinned to the top of the uh, comments field. So you could quickly jump to particular topics. And if you wanted to search for particular topics that have been covered in previous live streams, we've answered over 21,000 questions. You could go to cubaseindex.com and Jan from Stockholm is kind enough to create that website. So we're going to give a special thanks to Jan. Uh, also, we have two people that serve as moderators. We have Jazz Dude and Agent K, and I saw that Agent K wasn't able to be on the live stream today. So, but they're not Steinberg employees, and they really just kind of do this out of the goodness uh, of for the benefit of the community. So, we want to give a special thanks to them. Uh, we'll give a special thanks also to Jazz Dude for his work with the Cubase Nation Discord, which is a wonderful resource of information that's relevant to the Steinberg community. Um, so today is the last live stream of the month, and as per uh, per tradition, what we do is we'll go for about two hours, and then we'll have a Zoom social meetup so everyone can kind of meet and hang out and catch up in person, and other people can talk besides myself. Um, and I look forward to these every month, um, and I posted the link to it. So but we'll be starting about 3 o'clock, so about two hours from now, depending on where you, what time zone you're in. Uh, so with that, since we have kind of an abbreviated um, time frame, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay, so we see uh, Jazz Dude. We see Nick from the UK is on. We have Stefan from Sweden. Peter from Montreal. And Madge Deepers, checking in from a very wet UK. So yeah, we're just about ready to get about three days, three and a half days of rain here. So we have Robbie Bowling from Dallas, John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Okay. We have Pa Ra just says uh, in his question, just ask if it's possible just to ask a question in the chat. And yep, that's what we do. You ask questions in the chat and we'll answer it. All right. Okay, so we see uh, just from John Costigan, um, and this is directed to Jazz Dude, but I may be able to help. Uh, it says, my Cubase 12 update went okay. I had to move the libraries from uh, my E drive to where they thought they were uh, D uh, from the tech guy uh, changing my drive letters. Now it's asking for dozens of locations. So probably, John, what you could do is check out. There's going to be a little utility that is installed. So anytime that if you wanted to make the association, it's going to be the Steinberg Library Manager. So if you wanted to just go to... Uh, like all of your Cubase content, um, once you're, you know, once you, if you just wanted to go directly on the drive itself, uh, like to the location where the content is, you could just double click on that. That will launch this program and this will automatically make the association for Cubase and GrooveAgent files and Hallian 
for uh, so that Cubase can and the instruments can find all of their content. So often just double clicking on the content will kind of reestablish the association if it was seeing it or wanting to see it from a different drive. So go ahead and give that a try. I'm just gonna break out my chat so I can read it a little easier. Okay, so we see Soren from Sweden. Yeah, I did get your uh, email, so I think we'll get to get to it towards the end. All right, so we have uh, Jacques Herb. Hope I pronounced that correctly. From Holland on Cubase 12 Pro. Thanks for joining us. All right, and uh, Sina from Colorado. All right, Uno Memento from Finland. All right, so a question uh, for the film scoring: What is the correct way to work in 48K and convert all samples to this rate? I can export my project in 48K into Mixdown and work in 44.1 difference. Thanks. So I, I think I, I think there's still a lot of film composers. I think Hans Zimmer still does stuff at 44.1, uh, and then they'll just kind of record it in you know, if they needed to or export to the particular uh, sample rate at 48K when when they need to. Uh, but a lot of times they're still dealing with like audio CDs. Um, so I think that, you know, it's not uncommon to work off 44.1 and then export at 48K. Uh, some people will want to maintain kind of the same sample rate as the film that's going to be used if the music, you know, won't be done on CD uh, or the primary delivery format won't be for an audio CD. So people often work at 48K um, when dealing with video, but it seems like a lot of my composer friends still do uh, work at a 44.1K sample rate. And, you know, they may just hit play and capture it into another instance of Cubase or into a different computer. Um, so, but either way, you know, it's, it's easy to work with and do that. All right, we have David M. checking in from Liverpool. We see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. I, I enjoyed watching, seeing your pictures from Roxy Music last night, the concert, I guess. All right. Uh, so we see a question from Peter. Uh, at the rate of several Club Cubase presentations a month, how long would it take to cover all Cubase's features, if ever? It's a pretty big program. So we're over 21,000 questions. I think it's like our 246th or 247th live stream since COVID started. So, and But they keep adding new features as well. So, And there's so many great features that people get to discover on the live streams all the time. All right, so we see Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. Hope you're okay with the storm. I saw that it was kind of hitting Wilmington area, kind of the bottom of it. Hope you and your family are safe. We have Chris Hallam checking in from Athens, Georgia. All right, Grant Nicholas from Baltimore. Glad you can make it, buddy. Okay, so we have a um, question, uh, Cubase 11.03 Mojave. I'm trying to cue the same master in five different formats for export, but I just uh, get only one file after export is finished. Uh, does it, should it work like that? All right, so if I wanted to export a particular file format, uh, what we could do is come over here, we'll go to our export audio mix down. All right, and let's say I wanted to do multiple exports. So I'm just gonna do like my stereo out and we want to make sure that we have the export queue uh, turned on. So we'll see this little triangle. So we're gonna go make sure that that is set up. So we'll say, okay, I want this to be a wave 44.1. Um, and then at this point, uh, Just give it a name. OK, 
Okay, so we can say wave, and then we'll say add to queue. And now when I want to come over, I want this to be a wave at 48K, add to queue. Uh, I want this to be uh, an MP3 at 128, add to queue. Uh, and then I want this to be um, an MP3 at 48K at 320, add to queue. So we'll just click here. So now we have four different exports. I'm just gonna choose to put it into, let's go to my desktop. We'll do new folder. <laughs> and I'll hit save. And now I'm gonna start to queue export. So see our multiple files and I'll go to my desktop. I think I put it in the delete folder. And it may have gone into, let me just check the folder again. I'm just gonna check the project folder here quickly, see if it went in there by accident. Just gonna try one more time, make sure I have the file path correct. Oh, and could be because I have parts muted. But let me just take a look in the particular folder. So I think that we want to come over. But I think that's, you know, so make sure that you, um, just come over and as you're doing it, that you get the audio mix down and that you add these to the queue and I'll probably take care of it for you. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, I'd like to know what's the best way to sync Cubase and, and Pro Tools to Ableton Live? So I think currently, um, so I can't really speak of Pro Tools. I know that if you wanted to do Cubase and Pro Tools, um, you know, people use MIDI timecode for that. Um, and then you probably want, if you're dealing with audio in both systems, make sure that you have a digital audio clock that's actually being kind of generated uh, for that. Um, and if you, so probably just MIDI timecode and you want to make sure that you have, uh, you know, if it's on different computers that you are connecting the clock between the different audio interfaces. All right, so we have uh, Kuba uh, checking in from South Africa. Thanks for joining us. All right, and we have Carlos from Colombia, Mark Winslow from Honolulu. Thanks for joining. Right, it's early there. Matt Elliston from outside of London. I see Tim Weinheimer saying Roxy Music was great.
All right, so we just see uh, from Endred uh, what's going on. So, you know, what we do is um, answer people's Cubase questions live. So, uh, so you have questions on Steinberg products, you could just answer it and then we'll go through and answer the question. You, you just ask the questions, we'll go through and answer it. All right, so we see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. Um, so it, yesterday was Michael's birthday. So in honor of Michael's dedication to the live stream, I'm going to give Michael Teams one gallon of hazelnut gelato. So I think everyone should pass on one gallon of ice cream to Michael Teams in appreciation for all he does. All right, so we have a question. Um, can we snap quantize in the audio loop preview in Media Bay? That'd be handy if you wanted to set your own loop points. Um, also, transpose function would be great. So w when we're doing kind of you know typical previews, you know, there's no real timing reference to actually snap to because it's not on a grid um to to have a reference so that's why you know once it's in the project we can snap to the grid but here there's no grid to actually snap to um so and currently there isn't a transpose function as you had noted uh, and some people have asked for that and i'll kind of reiterate but if you wanted to quickly create like even a sampler track you could just transpose But again, a lot of times the transposition could be based upon what is in the project. So if it's not in the project yet, it's hard to have a reference for it. Okay, so Soren says he already picked up something useful with a multi-format export, just listening. All right, so we have a question uh, from Andrew. It says, I just got Pro and love the new version options. What's the best way to record uh, to the same loop and then choose the best takes for ba bass guitar, for example? All right, so luckily I'm a bass player, so all my projects that I get to record are just based on bass. So let me see if I have project I'm thinking of here. All right, I'll just go to open it. Okay, so let's say I've done kind of a cycle recording. And once we have like multiple recordings, we'll see these in lanes. So I'll go ahead and just make all the lanes here a little bigger. So if we wanted to grab the little tool that looks like a hand, this is the comp tool. So now I can select between different takes. And if I wanted to just take a selection and say, okay, I want these different parts. And if I wanted to audition different parts, I could just hold down control or command and say, oh, I like that one better. And then once we're all done, we could just close the lanes and then we could have everything just kind of automatically create our different performances just like so. So as you record like multiple performances, they'll show up in lanes. And at this point you could just come right over there and see each of the lanes and use the comp tool to come up with comps very easily. All right.
All right, so we have a question from uh, Elizabeth uh, Gomez. Uh, hello, for some reason, whenever I move an audio event, I cannot move it freely. Uh, it moved per block, regardless of my setting of eighth, et cetera. I don't have the uh, grid function active, so it's probably gonna be snap. So if I'm moving different events, so, and you could do this by, you could turn this on and off by hitting the letter J on your computer keyboard. And it might be, uh, so if we come here, we'll just see snap. So a snap on, and I have this set to bar. When I move an event, it's only going to allow me to to place it at measures. With this disabled, hitting J, I guess in Spanish it's Jota, if my high school Spanish serves me right. Uh, so if that is turned off, then I could freely move it and place it anywhere that I want. So if I want it to be a little early, a little late, we can freely place it, but once this is turned on, it's gonna only snap to the bar or whatever snap value is set directly there. So once this is disabled, then you can place it freely. So let me know if that helps, Elizabeth, and thanks for being on the live stream today. All right, so we have Kenneth from Copenhagen. Thanks for joining and being on the live stream. All right, so you see Michael Teams is happy for the hazelnut ice cream. So it's actually, we'll do, we'll make it official and do hazelnut gelato. That, that's what I got my wife drunk on when I proposed to her, so. The gelato is better. All right. All right. Um, so I see I exported a song once and then remix it and tried to export it a second time, but it wouldn't do. I do. Um, So it could be, you know, if you go to export a particular project, so let's say we do an export audio mix down in conflicts, um, try to maybe here just say always at or create unique file name. So sometimes if you're creating kind of the same file name uh, over and over again, you know, it might do something like that, but you should be able to export multiple times. All right, uh, so we see, uh, hi Greg, I use Cubase 12 Pro. I lost part of my audio track in my project while trying to change the sample rate from 44.1 to 48K. How do I get them back? Um, so I'm not sure how you did the uh, sample rate conversion, um, but you know, so let's say if I go to this project and I wanted to do sample rate conversion on it. So I would come over here and let's say, um, like how I do the sample rate conversion without problems is to go to the project setup. Uh, and say, okay, I want this to be 48K now, and hit OK. And we'll ask, do you want to convert the files to the new rate? And we'll say convert. Uh, do you want to keep the source files in the pool directory? So this would keep the 44.1 files in addition to creating the new 48K. So uh, just come over here and hit keep. Um, and it says, do you want to convert? sample rate, so we'll just do that. Um, 
And if you want to keep the source files in the pool directory, so we'll keep. Okay. And then do you want to keep the audio files at their sample position? Choose no. Um, so if the file, if you have some files that are missing, I would go into the pool window and look in the trash. And then at that point, you may see that, you know, some of those particular files, you know, may just be directly uh, in the trash folder of the pool. So go, come over here to um, media to pool window. And if you're missing files, look to see if they got placed into the trash and let me know. And if also, if you could specify how you did the sample rate conversion, that would be helpful as well. All right, so I see from uh, Mark Winslow, um, do you use a base preamp pedal or just plug base directly into the interface? I have lots of base preamp pedals. Um, like I think the base part that I was just playing, that was just straight into like an older Steinberg CI2, I believe. But uh, like all the recordings I did for Hot Mess, which is a group of Michael Teams and Gareth and Pablo, who are, we all kind of met on the live streams. I just went direct into the interface, but uh, I have uh, a Sans amp. I have an Ampeg SVP Pro, like a rack mount tube preamp. Um, that's wonderful. I have an Ampeg SCR DI, um, but a lot of times I'll just plug directly in. So, um, but most of the time I just plug directly in for my bass. Okay, Uno Memento wants people to whack the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that as well. And that allows us to continue to do these. All right. All right, so we have a question uh, from Carlos. It says, question, for some reason when I solo something, its volume rises a lot, and then when I take everything back, uh, it goes down. It's confusing. All right, so let's say if I'm doing this. So let's say, and I wanted to solo a guitar. So that seems to keep the level the same. Um, so I wonder, you know, I could see it maybe changing if like that guitar was being fed uh, into a group that was maybe being compressed and there's other elements that aren't triggering the compression as much. Um, so let's say if I had all of my drums and and my guitar going into a group and then the and there's a compressor on the group. So let's say I wanted to take um, all of these tracks and this track. And I'm gonna add a group channel. So now he's all the group. And let me just make sure my drums are, I'll route these all to the group channel. So hold down my alter option. Okay, so our group is has our, so let's say now on the group, we have, compression like heavy handed compression here so 
So now if I solo like a track. You know, it, so maybe it's being routed to a group with other tracks and when those particular tracks aren't feeding the compression, it's actually changing. Um, but, you know, before we did that, we could see that as we would solo any track, uh, it would automatically just um, carry over and be kind of the same level. Sometimes people also run into this, like, you know, with a listen bus. Um, so let's say... So if I just want to take, you know, the bass. And so, okay, so as soon as I go here. So, but it seems like the same levels, like they're not changing. So maybe it's like sharing dynamics processing somewhere and that's causing the level difference. All right, so we have Kenny Jobson. Thanks for being on. Okay, so we have Aaron Michael. Um, Antzak, Antzak, uh, long time user, first time streamer. How do you best organize plugin libraries? Um, so, you know, each plugin may handle their content differently. Um, so we saw before, just like, you know, if you're dealing with the library manager, so if you wanted to, if it's with a particular um, Steinberg content, and this may be slightly different for each plugin. So if you have contact, it might be different. Or if you're running, you know, other uh, like drums that have lots of samples. So let me just close that. It's not what I want to see. All right. So like when we go to the um library is library manager so as soon as we if it's dealing with the content you know so there's a whole kind of library manager and it'll default you could set up a default location where everything is going to be installed to for the content that cubase looks to uh, you could move these manually uh, to different locations by, you know, clicking on move as well. Uh, but with like third party content, uh, it could be, um, different choices. And if it's dealing more with, um, like organizing how plugins are seen and approached, you could come over to like the, uh, plugin manager. So if we go to your studio menu, You'll see VST plugin manager, and then you could create new collections and organize how the plugins show up. So, but if it's like a third party um, provider, you may have to. Uh, every company would probably offer a unique solution that's kind of outside of Cubase's realm. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, I'm going to post the uh, Zoom meetup. So, again, in about, in about, uh, two hours after we started, we will have our Zoom get together. They're always wonderful. All right. All right. So we see Elizabeth just thanks thanking us for the reply. All right. So we just see uh, just question um, or comment also hope Cubase will support tighter integration with NI complete control MIDI controller in a future update so generally with the MIDI controllers it's the MIDI controller company kind of uh, you know does the work for the integration we have API's and we have a new MIDI remote system and we've you know sent out you know the software to all the companies so that they can make MIDI remote scripts some companies have already you know delivered those and some haven't so make sure that you reach out to all of the, uh, you know, to your controller company because we sent the software out to them. All right, so we see Michael Pierce going to be dipping in and out today. So thanks for joining us.
All right. Uh, so we see um, uh, Cubase version 12 Pro, a question from Madge Deepers. Uh, my mix console, my next previous mixer bank zone options are missing. In the MIDI remote functions browser and reloading the scripts doesn't replace them. Any ideas, please? So let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so. All right, so say I just want to do next mixer bank and apply the mapping there. And let's say previous mixer bank. So let's say all right, so I just assign these, so I just went into the mapping assistant and we did the action, so let's say I'm going to add a number of audio tracks. Okay, so we see this white outline indicating. So if we're to look at the mix console here, we'll see these, um, like these lines here indicating which eight controllers are being done. So if I do next or previous, that seems to kind of work as expected. So Madge, try to, uh, once again, in the MIDI remote, you could set up the various buttons and go to the mapping assistant. So if you just double click once you have the button created, uh, go to the mapping assistant, then you could go to um, the functions and look under mix console, mixer bank zone, actions and then you should see maybe next and previous mixer banks and see if that works for you okay so we see spike williams from wales he's the whack number 49 on the like button All right, so we see, is there an EQ in Cubase that's similar to Fab Filter? Question, uh, similar to Fab Filter Pro Q3 and or one that can filter out the low end uh, fully at the bottom left and then also auto sweep it back in. So you could do this a number of different ways. So let's go to just our audio channel here and go to the settings. So if you wanted to go to um, your low cut at this point, we could just say, okay, um, you could just, you know, have it work just like that. So let's say, uh, if I will revert this project and I'll just put on the master bus so we could hear it. So if I want to come here. And that could be automated. So now, just rewind a little bit. And we can see the automation going on. So you could just do the low cut. Also, if you want to get like more kind of, so it's just automation going on. And if you want to get more surgical with uh, EQ functions, I uh, suggest you check out Frequency EQ. Uh, so this is where we could have 
you know, eight bands, linear phase. Uh, di- each band could be dynamic processing as well. Um, so as soon as we wanted to go to our dynamic processing, we could choose for these to be, uh, you know, on mid side or left right channels independently and be able to kind of, you know, have uh, whether we wanted to be peak or low shelf, high shelf EQs just by selecting your different types, or if you wanted to have a 96 dB cut as well. So I think those would probably meet your needs, but let me know if that makes sense. All right, so we have Frau Sen. Sen, uh, hi from Germany, thanks for the awesome support, and thanks for being on the live stream. All right. All right, so I see uh, it seems only missing from this with the MIDI remote question. Um, so from Madge, it says it seems only missing from the default page. So I'm not sure if it's um, if it's a particular controller or if it's a script you made or if it's like your Korg Nano control. So if you know if it's a Korg Nano control, you can actually just kind of hit the mapping pages until uh, I think one of them will say like you know like mixing control surface or something like that. All right, so we see from Luca just says, uh, the MIDI remote function from Cubase 12 transformed my Behringer X-Touch 1 into a monster of hotkeys and functions. It's absurd. So that's great. All right, so I see, uh, hi there. Um, I saw an option in FL Studio that could turn an audio file into automation. Can this be done in Cubase 2? So um, I'm not sure like what you want to do with the particular automation. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I, you know, like each audio file can have automation. You know, sometimes we could take audio and convert it to different, you know, so we could have all of your, you know, automation points here, and you can move those up and down. Um, but let me know, like, you know, because, you know, like automation is a component, could be a component of a track that's affecting audio. But if you could indicate what exactly the audio, like, you know, maybe you, like if you want to turn it into MIDI data or look at it in score, but, you know, um, but like automation, I would consider kind of a, a part of the mix that affects the audio file. So maybe if you could uh, specify a little more, I could, I'll try to help you with that. I'm sure Cubase could probably do something. Right. So I see um, from the Philip Cass is not sure if it's an auto gain issue built into the plugin. Let me see if I could find. What if I missed part of the first question? Okay, um, so I don't see kind of if that's like kind of a follow up question to an original question or to another question. Um, just taking another look. Still looking. Um, all 
So I, just from the Philip cast, maybe I missed the first part of the question, but maybe if you're able to ask again. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, so we see uh, Zounds by Timo says, a question from the last live stream. I still can't audition audio loops and samples without having to drag them into the project window first. Okay, so probably what you need to do is just to come over here. So let's say if you want to audition loops, uh, sorry if I misunderstood your question where we're just auditioning. Um, so what you may want to do is just go to your audio connections and go to the control room and you wanna activate a monitor uh, and probably just take the outputs and set this to not connected and then activate the control room. You can right click, you'll see add monitor and set your audio outputs directly from the uh from the monitor here so you could type in like uh, my yamaha hs7 so now when i click this signal for previews is often routed through the control room so try that so again yeah because i thought last time you were wanting to hear as you dragged it in um, but not until, not that you're not hearing it until it's dragged in. So go to audio connections, control room, make sure that the control room is active, right click. And then at that point, um, add a monitor and then set that. And you probably, if you have it, set it in the outputs, set this to not connect it cause it may doubly bus the signal. So give that a try. All right. So we have Rude Screen checking in from the uh, UK. Okay, we see from Endred, uh, how to use audio as a MIDI controller in Cubase. Um, so I'm not sure if you wanted to take an audio file and be able to, you know, control you know, I'm not sure if you want. So as I read the question, it's just going to be, um, so way to use audio as a MIDI controller. I mean, we could use a MIDI controller, you know, to control, uh, you know, to control audio parameters. So if I wanted to just, you know, have my, you know, con MIDI control surface, I could come over here and be able to um, you know control different parameters. So if we had like my quick control knobs, I can go to a particular, uh, I'll go to my quick controls and I'll just activate my default quick controls. And now if I just wanna move knobs, I could adjust the volume, panning and different parameters like my high cut low cut filter from my MIDI controller. So let me know if you want the MIDI controller to control audio or if you want the audio to control the MIDI controller, so. Okay, so we see uh, from the Philip cast, we have this question now. Um, stock plugins have a volume boost around 50% on wet slash dry. Not sure if that's an auto gain issue. All right, so I think this is kind of mailed in as well. So let me just create it just a quick audio file to test this with. All right, so what I'm gonna do is let's say I just have a test tone here. So we're gonna have this same exact level. So this is a question that's kind of emailed in. I'm gonna make sure it's just doesn't 
kill everyone volume wise let's say we have just an oscillator test tone so it's totally consistent in our level and i'm going to put this into just a loop and the question was like you know does like and those mailed in was with the tube compressor if setting you know, so right now I have it set to zero dB in and zero dB out. So we're not affecting the gain here at all. And I'm just going to go to the mix. But when we kind of look at. It's because it's, you know, I think. So we see as we have it here. It looks like it's the channel volume is increasing. So let's go ahead. Um, so, but let's say, see if it changes. If I go to low and high here and change the ratio. So I think it's just going to be, you know, the intention of this is not necessarily for gain matching, but blending in the processed signal. So, you know, when it's half, you know, for parallel processing. So it may, you may just get kind of a gain bump because it is combining the processing of the signal, you know, so instead of having to do parallel processing, you find the sweet spot just by adjusting the mix control on a plugin. So this is without the plugin on. And now that we have both of them blended together, that's why you're going to get a bit of a little bit of a volume bump there because it's blending the two signals and it's almost basically doubling this the sound. So All right, so you just see from Endred, uh, sorry, I want to use my guitar as a MIDI controller, kind of, a way to convert uh, live my guitar to a MIDI track controlling my piano, for example. So to do it live, you're going to need to get a MIDI pickup. So, you know, that's going to be the best solution is to get a MIDI pickup. You know, you could... I don't think there's anything that's going to, like an app or a plug-in or a program that's going to... Uh, work satisfactory uh so you're probably going to need a midi pickup on a guitar so if you want it to play a piano it's you know it's not just plugging your guitar into the program and having that uh controlled um so but and you know some things may be able to do it like tracking may be bad for monophonic sources but i think you're going to need an actual guitar uh, midi pickup system like from roland or yamaha All right, so I'm going to post the Zoom meetup link here. And then um, I'll go to, we had a bunch of questions that were sent in. So let me go to those. And if you learn a new tip or trick, make sure that you actually do hit the like button. All right. All right, so we had a uh, question. Um, can the Cubase channel strip be placed before inserts in signal flow? Um, so yeah, if we wanted to do that, uh, if we open up the channel strip, so as we look at it by default, the inserts, you know, it'll basically go like from left to right. Uh, so we see our inserts, our channel strip, and our channel strip can include the EQ, then sends, then Q sends, and fader. So this is kind of our signal flow. And if we wanted to alter the signal flow between like the channel strip and let's say our, and the inserts, all we'd have to do is you'll see this little button. And now the channel strip comes into signal flow before the inserts. And now the inserts come before the channel strip so you could just 
come over and just kind of, you know, just simply move those that button to switch the signal flow between inserts or channel strip being first. All right. Okay, so just see a question. Um, how can I back up my preset star ratings in Retrolog, Halion, and Pad Shop, etc.? I have given all presets a zero rating in Media Bay and the instruments themselves. However, when I store ratings in the instruments, they do not appear in Media Bay. So I'm a little confused and don't want to continue rating if I can't track if I can't back these up for years to come. Thanks. All right, so let's say I have a retro log instance. And I go to open up the instrument. All right, and I'm looking for presets. So let's say I like this particular sound. So uh, let's say I'll just come over here. We'll say absolute 80s. So I want to give this five stars. So we could just come over here. I'm going to give absolute 80s five stars. Okay, so I've made that particular rating. Okay, so now when I want to look for particular sounds, I could just say, you know, I could have it search for like five star sounds if we wanted to. All right, so let's go see if this carries over into Media Bay. So I'm going to go to the full media bay. So we did absolute 80s. Um, and I'm going to come over to retro log sounds. All right, so I see that the absolute 80s here is still maintains the five stars that we set from the particular instrument. So let's say I want to go to acid synth and give it one star. Okay, so we have five stars for absolute 80. Acid synth has one star. So let's go back into Retrolog and we'll open up Retrolog and let's do acid synth. And that is automatically carried over. So it's kind of bi directional communication. So if I make it in Media Bay, it carries over here. If I make it in um, the instrument, it carries over to Media Bay. Now to back these up to like a different computer, all we would have to do is if you go to preferences on a Mac, we could come over to our explore or finder and then we'll go to library and then we'll see Cubase 12 under preferences. So go to Cubase 12 and then you'll see a file called uh, media bay 3.db. So as soon as you, you know, if you wanted to migrate this to other systems in the future, uh, just simply move that file from this computer to another computer and all the ratings will get carried over to the new computer system. If you're on Windows to access that folder quickly, and I'll just show this. You'd go to the start menu and then go to all programs and then where you'll see like the Steinberg Cubase 12 or Cubase 11 folder. Uh, and instead of opening, you open up the program folder and then you'll see user settings data folder. And that's how you could access that uh, directly inside uh, on the Windows version of Cubase. So. All right, let me jump back. See, we have some more live questions. All right, so we have uh, Mikhail Hovell checking in from Israel. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Drona Arkaya. Um, Hi, Greg. Can you tell me about the options I get when I apply a process to individual events? 
They say new version, cancel, and continue. I don't know what they mean. All right, so let's say if I wanted to do um, processing, so let's say I have uh, like a voice file here. All right, I'm just gonna take this out of musical mode here quickly. All right, so if at this point, if I just take a file over, so I want to, and let's say I want to do processing on it, so I'm gonna go to audio, I'm gonna just select a particular range, and let's say, um, I want to do a fade in. Now there's a preference for this. So I'll just go back to one of those uh, buttons you often get asked once. Um, so, and it's on processing shared clips. We'll get this options dialog. So let me go ahead and just remove that process. So let's say I wanted to now, um, stereo flip that particular just do it from here all right so sorry let me just make sure i hit the correct my preference is set Okay, so when we do the processing, the three choices that you get are new version. So that's gonna make a new version of the audio file. So your original, the concept is with a new version, the original file will always be intact. And as we do processing, it's gonna create a new version of the audio file with the processing embedded. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Cancel it means that it's not going to apply that particular processing. And continue will allow you to just process it but not keep the original file intact. So, um, so we can think of new version is keeping the original file uh, in addition to the newly processed file, cancel won't do any processing and continue will just allow us to uh, not have that particular file automatically saved for you. Those are the three different choices. All right, so we have Camille checking in from Czech Republic. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have Graham Witchers going to be on the live Zoom. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you there. Okay, so we just see a question. Uh, hi, Greg. When using a, st a when using stock sample, why does the sample slow down when a separate key is played on the lower range, vice versa for a higher range? So I guess if we're doing kind of like. All right, so let's say if I wanted to come here, and this is how samplers work. So, you know, if I play a higher pitch or lower pitch, it's it will kind of just play back the same sample pitched up. Now, if you don't want it to do that, and that's the typical behavior, so if I hit the root note, if I hit an octave lower, it's going to play back half the half the pitch and half the speed. So, but if you don't want that, all you have to do in the sampler is enable uh, audio warp. So we'll just say, okay, we want to turn on audio warp. And now I'll get the same speed regardless of what pitch I play. So once audio warp is turned off,
So enable audio warp here. That's how you could often in early day sample something and just change their pitch and not worry about copyright stuff as much. All right, so we see, uh, just going back to our processing question. Um, so as, as a supplement to that question is, where does the old version go? How can I switch back to it uh, from the pool, I'm guessing? So the, when you do processing on a file, uh, and you go to the pool window, often you'll see um, a separate folder for edits, like at the project level. But as soon as we want to, you know, if we do processing, so let's say if I come here to my offline processing, um, so let's say we'll go to our um, sorry, direct offline processing, so if we have done changes here um, at any point in time, if you select it and hit F7 to open up the direct offline processing, I could just say, okay, I just want to um, delete just the stereo flip but leave the envelope, or we could choose to delete all or delete just a single portion, and it will access the original file from the edits folder. So when you look at your project, you know, you may have like the project file, an audio folder, and images, and you'll have an edits folder. So the the original files will go into the edits folder. Great, right, wonderful to see uh, Val Lee from Vienna. Thanks for joining us. All right, and we have uh, Theodore from South London, Southeast London. Great to see you back. All right, let's go to some in our question that was mailed in. All right, so we see a question. Hi, Greg. Uh, I really need your support on how I can put communicate uh, out my Phantom G8 with my DAW, Cubase 12 Pro. I've searched for many tutorials, but none of them match what my needs. Can you please help on that? I look forward to hear from you soon. So. Um, so when using, you know, things are very convenient using virtual instruments. And so we could just treat a, you know, anything that's going to be connected. So probably the Phantom G8, I assume will have a USB connection to the computer. So if I have a virtual instrument, um, you know, we will see on its input drive. So like I have a Nectar panorama. So if I wanted to see my Nectar, you know, uh, I could have, you know, I'll see my MIDI input output driver uh, listed in the input and output selections on Cubase. Uh, and these could all be routed to in all MIDI inputs. So if I wanted to play like a virtual instrument from the Phantom, I would, if we see the Phantom listed here, it's probably going to be set to in all MIDI inputs. So now... So we're going to be able to play. Um, so at that point, we're just going to be able to play. And that will allow us to play sounds and instruments are built into the computer. So the computer, uh, you know, if we're to think about really, in essence, what a like a keyboard workstation like a Phantom is, it's a computer that's playing back sounds. Many people choose just to use the particular sounds that come uh, to, you know, instead of using an outside source, we could use the internal source of the software to be able to play all of our different sounds like so. So that, that makes sense. But now if we want to have, you know, because right now the software is generating the sound, but the Phantom X8 is also a tone generator. So if we have a, if you have a mixer, what you could do is just simply... What many people do is take the audio outputs of the particular uh, key uh, out of the keyboard and into a mixer that's also mixed with the outputs from your uh, from your audio interface. And then what we could do is we could add a MIDI track, and this MIDI track 
we want to say it's coming in from all MIDI inputs, which would include the Phantom, and it's going to be sent out to your particular device. So let's say you'd probably see your Phantom listed here. I'll just say my UR24C. So now MIDI information is gonna come in, pass through Cubase, and be sent out to the Phantom. The Phantom is going to generate the sounds. So the audio output of the Phantom could be sent into a mixer. That's pretty typical. So you'll, you know, because Cubase is not generating the sounds, the Phantom is generating the sounds. Now, some people want the ability of taking their external hardware and processing it in the wonderful world of all of the EQs and, and various inserts that are gonna be uh, available on the particular system. So if I wanted to go to an audio track and say, oh, I wanna take my keyboard and run it through all these amazing processors. What we could do at that point is, if you have Cubase Pro, is go to your audio connections and we'll say, okay, I want to go to external instruments. And what we need to do is you need an audio interface with an additional input or with inputs. And we can say, okay, I want to, we'll click on add external instrument. I have one kind of configured here for a montage. Just imagine that said phantom. Uh, and what we need to do is to tell, take the audio outputs of the phantom and connect it to inputs on the audio interface. So this way, the audio that's being generated by the keyboard is now going out from the device and is going into the audio interface. So once that is set up, I can come over here, say well, let's add an instrument track and we'll see under external plugins, you, you can see your montage or your phantom. And now at this point, I could play and the audio, as we play the MIDI, the audio from the device is going to be fed back into Cubase so that I could do further processing. Once we have, uh, if we wanted to have the Phantom work as a MIDI remote, at this point we could say we want to add a MIDI remote. You could say, okay, I want this to be a Roland. You could say, okay, I want this to be Phantom. Select a MIDI input and output port. And we could create a MIDI control surface. So now if I wanted to have knobs that actually control different aspects, I'll just come over here and let's say, okay, I just want this to be kind of like a slider. Uh, I'm gonna move, uh, and I don't have this physically connected, but we could make you know different sliders, and we could have different functions. Um, so let's say if I just want to come here, so if I have knobs or sliders on a keyboard, we could have these control different functions in the program. So when I hit a button on my keyboard, that that does a function in the per, in the software for control. So those are some ways that you could integrate your Phantom into Cubase. So it's a lot of different ways. So as you can see, once everything is living in software realm, that it's very convenient. But you know, if you have the investment in that, then it's a uh, you could definitely use it in conjunction with Cubase. All right, let's go back to live questions. Thanks for all the great questions. And again, if you learned something new, make sure you hit the like button and. I'll go ahead and post the uh, the Zoom link. Will be about forty five minutes. All right. Um, so we see, hi Greg, uh, I know how to use the Arranger track in Cubase, but I'm wondering if there are plans to add something like Ableton Arranger View or Logic's Live Loops, thanks. So generally, you know, I can't really talk about future stuff. Um, so, you know, we've obviously heard of, you know, people wanting that functionality. 
Um, but I can't really talk about future stuff until it's released, but I'll make sure that it's kind of reiterated again that people are looking for that particular functionality. All right. Um, all right, so we see a question from Uno Memento. Uh, how can I slide a single bass sound up an octave? Okay, so let's come over here. I'm gonna add just a quick instrument track. I'll go to, let's say, Hallian Sonic SE. All right, kind of has a, just when you're looking for a simple bass part, let's see. Okay, so let's say I just have kind of simple bass part. <clears throat> and what we could do is let's say I'll go here to edit. Um, and this could be in different spots, but you'll probably see something that's going to be um, like the amount of pitch bend on it. So let me just see. Um, So so different interfaces could have it on different spots. So let me just, but if we set the amount of pitch bend to go, let me just try a different patch. Okay, so let's say we'll come over here the voice. All right, so here we'll see like in this anima patch, we'll see uh, pitch bend up and pitch bend down. So if I wanted to just come here. So let's say I'll just turn off the arpeggiator. So it, it, this way you could just set the pitch bend amount and then just, you know, use pitch bend. And that way you could just kind of have access to it all. Let me just see if I could find it again. In... But you know, so generally within the instrument itself, there will be a pitch bend setting. And let me just see if it's somewhere hidden on this particular patch. But it's often going to be like just, you know, directly within a particular instrument where you could see the options. And it's probably somewhere. I'm just being myopic in my view. So, yeah, but you know, just set the pitch bend within the particular instrument. See, Andrew just saying it's it's amazing what, what can be done these days. We're really spoiled. So, yeah, we should just always appreciate all the great things that we can do. And Luca has a great point. I agree. Is that I'm happy for all those who can make music, though. All right, so let me jump to some of our questions. And again, if you learn something new, make sure you hit the like button. All right, sorry, I'll just mute that. All 
All right, so the next question. Um, is it possible to warp the start and end of a segment simultaneously in very audio free warp? Uh, example, I want to move the whole segment to the left without changing the length of the segment might be useful while editing vocals uh, when a few words in a row are ahead of the beat. Uh, I want to move them back to the correct position, but I don't want to alter the phrase in any other way. So far, I've only been able to move the warp start as the first step and subsequently move the end to the left. Uh, that is clumsy and tedious. All right. So I think there's a better way, you know, so when we do warping on particular uh, audio events, you know, the, the concept of warping and I'll just switch to my warp tool here and we'll choose our free warp is that, you know, we can take, you know, particular events and be able to say, you know, this, you know, this word was a little bit late or early. So I could say, okay, you know, someone blew the entrance right here and I wanted that to snap directly to the grid. And you can see that's going to adjust the other components. And it sounds like what you want to do may be a different type of editing. So instead of like, you know, moving all of these different warp markers, like to the left or right simultaneously, where you have to do it kind of individually, that's really kind of the essence. You know, you could select multiple warp, uh, warp markers across different tracks. But the approach that I would do is just to kind of select the range here and I'm just going to hit shift X and then hold down alt and control. So if you wanted to move all of the events earlier or later in time, hold down alt control or command plus option and just do a slip edit is really what it sounds to me, what you want to do. And that way you could just, you know, warping is kind of stretching the audio. So, but it sounds like you just want to, um, you know, again, that's holding down alt or option or command, uh, command, uh, command option and alt control, sorry. And that way you could just kind of slip the audio. And I think that's kind of what makes sense. All right. Next question. Um, I think we covered that already. All right. We jump back to live discussion. Okay, so we see uh, from Steph Sancia, um, I upgraded to Cubase Pro. It doesn't show my e-licensor. When I click uh, the EXE, it starts up as Cubase Elements, um, touches base, and then changes to Pro. It says I don't have a license for Pad Shop, et cetera. Um, and it says cost of fortune. Uh, anyway, just saying. Um, so it's not going to actually utilize the e-licensor. So the licensing system has actually gone to a new Steinberg licensing. So you may just see, um, you know, if you go to your Steinberg activation manager. So, uh, so if you just upgraded to Cubase 12 Pro, which is a great time because there's still a 40% discount. If we come over to, we'll see under applications or programs, you'll see the Steinberg activation manager. So it's what it does. If you upgrade it, it's going to put the license, uh, like a Cubase 11 license on the e-licensor that's non-upgradable, but everything else is going to be just handled in the activation manager. So, and then once you just go to the activation manager here, you could choose uh, what products that you want to see active and to be able to use. So make sure that you activate it here within uh, the Steinberg activation manager, which is installed with Cubase 12 Pro. All All right, and we have Nelson checking in from uh, Delta State in Nigeria. Thanks for joining the live stream today. All right, let's go back to another question that was mailed in since we had a lot. Make sure. 
All right. Um, so we see, uh, hi, Greg. Um, and this is from Jan, who sent um, an image as well. It says, uh, if I remove this warning, can I always get it to proceed and keep every time I use offline processing? I want it to always proceed and keep even when the warning is not shown. P.S. Um, so, yeah, if you, you know, and this was when you do processing on let's say if you've done very audio edits and then you do an offline process that you'll get a message indicating that you want to uh, automatically, uh, if you want to you know, basically uh, render the file before with all the very audio edits before applying the processing. So I, I, I will experiment more with this just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure if you just hit, you know, keep the original files, and it could be also contingent on uh, this preference. So if we wanted to go over here, we could just say it's going to be on, um, you know, this particular preference on editing audio, uh, on processing shared clips. So I think if you just choose create new version here and you choose not to do that, that that will automatically create the new version for you. All right, let me go back to your live chat. All right, uh, so we just see a question. Uh, in many official movie trailers, a dialogue phrase tone would sound different from the same dialogue with the same actor character from the actual movie, uh, i.e. Joker movie. Uh, it feels as if they changed the tone of the dialogue so it fits uh, with the music's tone slash scale uh, and still feel right, connected, and most importantly, uh, natural uh, on a specific form I uh, I've been told that it's not right to use dialogue on Melodyne slash Variati because it might sound unnatural so how do trailer engineers do that are there any tools that might be very helpful for taking care of dialogue for a trailer as it's is it related to EQ match um, so I think a lot of times you know what this is going to happen is and you realize that you know the people that do the trailers often you know, will be completely different than the people that mixed music. So often the trailers will have a different soundtrack, different audio team entirely than what's worked on the actual film. Um, so it's not uncommon for them to make little changes. And, you know, most, you know, it's very common to do pitch shifting on audio to, to have a particular impact. You know, a lot of composers, and I remember hearing um, Junkie XL, I think it was at a Sony mix for films, and he was a, the uh, featured speaker. Um, and, and, and Tom Holkenberg, you know, did a really wonderful job. And I think he was talking about Mad Max at the time and how you know, he specifically as a composer worked with the sound design team so that everything would make sense. Because, you know, in most films, the sound design team will do a lot of stuff. And then it could be that the sound designs are kind of in F, the key of F or like a big F note, but the score is in F sharp and no one knows until it's actually, you know, on the mixing stage. Oh, oh these things aren't working. Um, so they're actually starting to... You know, so there's kind of a trend where many of the film composers will just, um, you know, coordinate with the sound design team so that, you know, the sound design elements aren't clashing with the particular film score. But it's not uncommon, you know, for different dialogue things to be changed in, you know, a multitude of different ways. Very audio, just pitch shifting all sorts of things to make sure that it's working and realize that, you know, sometimes it may be, you know, like I had a friend who, you know, made more money, I think on the Godzilla trailer in like 1999 
for the two minute trailer than the composer did for the whole film. And they would have, you know, huge budgets, like $150,000 for music just, you know, for the orchestra, just for the trailer, because that was so important to the marketing of the film. So some people may say, oh, it'll never happen. But, you know, people do processing any way they need to to get the job done. All right, so we see from Ken Coleman, uh, just says, hi, Greg, upgraded to new computer, Cubase 12 from Windows 10 to 11. Cubase 12 has been real stable. New Intel 12th generation chips are incredibly fast. Audio performance, super low, love it. So that's great. Thanks for sharing. All right, so it says, uh, here's a question. Unfreezing in version 12 has new messages to delete or not delete the frozen files. What does this mean? Okay, so let's say I will freeze this piano part here. Okay, so I'm gonna come over here, we hit the snowflake. Um, so right now this is rendered as an audio file. And this could be one of those messages that you maybe say don't show again. All right, so if I go to move it, it's not gonna move because it's rendered as an audio file. When I go to unfreeze, we'll get the option of delete the freeze files. That means that the audio file that was underneath this that was playing back so that the instrument be can become unloaded and free up resources, we could keep those files or delete the freeze files. So let's say I choose to keep them and then I refreeze again. It just immediately uses the same exact, it will use the same files. But if we want to get rid of that files, I'll say delete the freeze files and hit okay that file is no longer in the particular project. So if I click on freeze for this project, and now we'll go into our finder and say, let's go to documents. We'll say hangouts. We'll find today's date. that you'll often, I'm not sure what these files just, but at this point you would often see like a, like a freeze folder at the project level. So, so that is basically erasing the underlying audio files that were frozen. That's what that is indicating. We see the, from Heartbreak Time Machine, it says this is also very common in video games, sound design slash music composition. Okay, let's go back to the mailed in questions. Um, okay, so we have a question. Um, I'm just gonna revert this project here quickly. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, what is the easiest way to save a MIDI performance to Media Bay within a Cubase project? I.e., can it be dragged? Uh, will the MIDI retain its cuts if it's cut into sections? Um, so let's say we have a MIDI performance, like just of a quick piano part here. Okay, so if I want it to uh, have this accessible. Um, so let's come over here and let's export a MIDI loop. All right, so let's say I have these this event here um, and I'll just, so and what a MIDI loop can do is take a single event and let's come over here and I'll just say file to export MIDI loop. All right, so MIDI loop will actually allow us to take this and let's say now if we want to go to our different loops and samples 
And let's say, okay, we want to go September. So now at this point, I could drag if I wanted to. So once it's exported, then it will be available to drag and drop into a project and it could be dragged and dropped directly into this. So this is different than a MIDI file. MIDI loop is only going to work and available for instrument tracks because the MIDI loop also loads up the particular instrument that it that is used to play back that sound whereas a midi file is just kind of the actual notes so it's not where we kind of drag and drop we would need to export it and give it a name otherwise it could just be like you know you know loop whatever but as soon as the loop is exported you can just come right over here to the loops and drag and drop that in All right, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to streamline creation of group tracks based on folders? Uh, what would be the best way then to apply a track preset to the resulting group track, um, i.e. a reverb to a drum group? Okay, so if we want it to, let's jump here. All right, so if I wanted to assign, um, you know, multiple files, let's say I want to take all my drums here and send it to a group track. Okay, so if I come here, I'm going to just select those channels and we can say, okay, let's add a group channel to the selected channel. So I'm going to say, we'll add a stereo group. Now all these tracks are now routed to the particular stereo group. So as we play. We can see my group. And at this point, if I wanted to on the group, you know, I could add a, you know, so like with drums, I probably wouldn't do this globally, but if you wanted to, you could just add an effects channel. So it's like, okay, I want to add a, a reverb to this. So let's say, okay, I just want to add a room, room works. So now, you know, everything is being kind of mixed. Like the group is going out, but often I would want to actually have control of the individual tracks. So we come to the group and I could send all the, everything in a group to the reverb, but that may not be what we want to do. So let's say I'll just, um, so what I would do, just like we added the actual tracks to, I would come over here, select and say, let's add a effects channel to the drums. So now every drum track When I come over here, I could send varying amounts. So we'll come over here to the reverb and now I could But let's say I don't want the overheads. And now we'll just listen to that in context. So this way each track could be feeding. By varying amounts. So that would be the best way to do it, I think, is just to select all the different sources that you want and be able to right click and say, you know, at that point, 
right click and add group channel to selected channels, add effects channels to selected channels. All right, so we have our question, uh, what is the best way to, uh, to ensure MIDI is always exported from bar one and as a single block, i.e. not split when there are no notes? Um, so when we go to export, you know, so a MIDI file itself, you know, has no concept of like part boundaries whatsoever. So, um, you know, and we have to think that, you know, like MIDI files have to work in other pro, you know, other like hardware sequencers, like a Roland MC505. We had to be able to take those things. So, you know, hardware sequencers, which have no basis for the actual data. So when, if you need to, you know, work with a particular MIDI file, realize that, you know, while we're kind of used to the Cubase paradigm that Steinberg pioneered years ago of these different arranger, uh, you know, parts on the timeline that, you know, that information is, you know, a MIDI file is going to be just a subset of information is not going to be able to contain any of that information. What the MIDI file is doing is on that particular track, it's exporting these notes occurred at this particular time. Uh, so it has no concept of, you know, what the parts are or what the parts, um, where they should be. That's just not included in the information that ensures that it works in all the different files that could import and export MIDI files. Okay. And another question says, uh, a lot of time when I, when friends open MIDI, I send them, they say it's offset. Uh, it's not a single block. So, you know, some programs, you know, and again, the block has no impact, you know, on the MIDI file has no bearings whatsoever on that. Some programs, if it sees that there's, you know, a big pause here may not put when it imports into their program, it may not automatically place, uh, events where there's nothing going on for a certain number of measures, but there's, it's nothing that could be included within the MIDI file. Cause that doesn't contain any information for that. All right. And we have another question. Um, I've had instances, uh, where I receive a piece of MIDI for some unknown reason. It doesn't matter what I try. It will not follow the project tempo, anything known to cause this. Um, so let's say if I, you know, I would first check to make sure that the track is set to, uh, musical mode. So let's say if I'm here and I'm playing, so the track here, we see this little icon, it looks like a clock. I'm going to just say we're at 120, I go to 140. It'll kind of, you know, play back the same times. So let's say, so I, I type in 200. So make sure that these are set to musical mode. And now that when we play it and it's set to follow, this MIDI track is set to follow the tempo. It's gonna play much faster now. So, you know, just make sure that the actual events here are set to musical mode. Uh, and it could also be sometimes, you know, some things may be locked in permission, like locked in position, but it's probably gonna be just making sure that these are set to musical mode. So make sure that that particular track right there is set to musical mode. All right. Um, and it says, how to configure, and someone had asked, um, like if you need to use the Steinberg UR24C driver to work with Bluetooth headphones to set Bluetooth to work from Cubase. Um, so really what you want to do, and from looking at the screenshot, it looked like it was a Windows program. So generally Bluetooth headphones for studio work um, are not ideal. One, they're gonna have a lot of latency in addition to the latency of your audio interface. And often, you know, they're gonna degrade the sound quality but it could also have an impact on uh, like limited, limiting you to specific sample rates. 
So, but, you know, to set it up is you would say, go to your audio system. It's not, you know, this is the audio interface driver for what I'm using. So if I wanted to do, you know, generally, if you don't see, there's a good chance that your Bluetooth headphones on Windows won't have an ASIO driver. So you would need to go into like the generic low latency driver, switch that. And at that point, when you go into the control panel, you could say, you know, send the audio out to, and this is Mac specific, but you could say send the audio out to my Bluetooth headphones instead of my HDMI port or my audio out, you know, my real tech audio driver, my built in audio. So uh, it's not, so you need to do it through kind of the actual uh, driver system, but realize that that's going to cause. Uh, that could be while the convenience of being wireless uh, is kind of far outweighed by the compromises you'll have to make to use Bluetooth headphones in kind of a studio uh, based environment. All right. All right, so I had a question. Uh, I started my PC and opened Cubase 12 for the first time. Nothing wrong yet. When I try to close Cubase, for whatever reason, I can't open it a second time. The Cubase startup screen freezes, um, and the only way to get Cubase from now on is to restart my whole system. I have to do this every day, which makes it almost impossible to work in Cubase 12. Uh, never had this problem with previous versions of Cubase. So it could be uh, sometimes when I've seen this happen is like when, you know, some – plugins don't release memory. Um, so two things, what I would try first is as you start, hold down um, alt control shift or command. Um, okay, so it says start at PC. So like hold down, like start Cubase and immediately after just hold down alt control shift and see if uh, you'll get prompted like, and if you wanted to run it in safe start mode where you could disable the preferences and I would try to disable the preferences and see if that changes the behavior for you. Um, and if that doesn't do it, I would, you know, maybe just do a quick reinstall on that. Um, and here's kind of maybe a second part to that question. Um, um, it says, after closing my first Cubase session, Cubase won't load because it can't find its license. Uh, see the second example and attachment. My internet connection is fine. I'm not doing anything special that can cause this. Um, so if the preferences don't work, what I would try to do is, you know, at that point, maybe just doing a reinstall of the application. Uh, I had something similar where, you know, it wasn't finding my licenses for Retrolog on my system here. So I just reinstalled Retrolog and I didn't have to do anything with the licensing. Then everything was fine. So if you have the ability, maybe just do a quick reinstall just of the Cubase application. Uh, I think that would kind of clear it up for you. All right. Let me go real quickly. See how we're doing in time. So we get one more couple more questions in before we migrate over to the Zoom. I'm going to paste the Zoom meetup details again. Thanks for everyone. Looking forward to seeing a bunch of people on the Zoom. All right, so I'm going to go just paste the Zoom credentials. Um, all right, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. All right, so let's get to another question that was mailed in. I think it's from Soren. Um, and it's a, how to record uh, like with the scale assistant from an empty MIDI track. Okay. So I'm just going to revert this project here. Okay, so let's say. 
All right. So, and I think the question was, um, and I saw that Soren had mentioned that he was having problems just kind of switching the record mode here. Um, it, and if you have problems, you know, I'm not sure. I've never seen it not kind of open immediately. I think sometimes, you know, opening and closing, like clicking a mouse may not help because you may, you may be closing it. Uh, but if you go to the transport here, we could set um, the, you know, MIDI record modes. So we could just say, okay, I just want to go to my MIDI record mode for new parts. Uh, or if we want to merge or replace that, we could just come here. So let's say I wanted to do just a quick um, stacked MIDI record. Um, so... And I think what Soren was running into is like with if there's no part here that we can't really turn on the scale assistant. Um, so if you really needed the scale, like if you needed to really start from, you know, you could just start from like a, a blank part, double click and say, okay, now I want my scale assistant to be C major and I want it to snap the live input. So, and without having to, you know, if I was just trying out different ideas and I just place it into record that now as I hit, I'm hitting a lot of black keys. All right, so now when we want to do the editing, at this point, you know, everything can be you know, all of my scale assistants. Let me just take a look. Um So, you know, you, you could apply it like that. Another way, Soren, that you could, another approach for this is, um, you know, because that's in the edit part, but you could also just go to the input transformer. So let's say, okay, I want this on the track um, and let's open up the panel. So we could say, I want to transform Type is equal to notes, and we'll go to insert, and we'll say value one. Um, I think there's a set to scale, transpose to scale, and say now I want this to be in C major, and then enable that. So as we go to record, and I'm just in cycle mode, so I don't have to set anything first. So now as I record, and as I play, so all of my, if I play like C, D, E flat, it sounds the same as C, D, E. So as I hit all the black keys, that's automatically mapping to the particular scale. So if you really wanted to do it before, try going to the scale assistant here and um, you know go to the MIDI input transformer, set it to the track, and we can say type is equal to note. We want to choose transform as the action and say value one transposed to scale and you could set your scale so even if you wanted this to be you know d major augmented scale you know you have a number of different scale choices all right so let's go back to our live chats thanks everyone for wonderful questions and if you do if you have learned some a new tip or trick make sure you do hit the like button all right let me go back to our questions and we'll be moving over in about five minutes to the zoom
All right. Um, okay. All right, so we see, uh, good day, Greg. Uh, do you know any controller to jog the timeline in the main window? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I, used, I use my CC121 for that, but you could just simply, you know, take, you know, if you wanted to go to, like, you know, MIDI remote. So let's say I want to take, you know, this function here. So let's say, okay, I have this knob and then I think if we come over here you could go to transport and we're just gonna key commands transport and then we could say jog left and apply the mapping so now as we move this knob you know we could just have this automatically kind of just jog over to the left and our knob to jog to the right. So you could just set up anything in the, in kind of the uh, MIDI remote in Cubase 12. All right, so we have Solomon London just saying he's glad to be here. We're glad you can make it. All right, next question. Uh, hey, Greg, I tried upgrading my artist to Pro 12, but I can't log in. Also, it doesn't allow me to buy without... Um, so I would check the, um, you know, like when you go to your, my Steinberg account. So let's say if you're here, and maybe you have to reset your password. All right, so let's say if you're here and you just go to your My Steinberg, you know, at this point, um, you know, if it has your email address that you could just do, a, you know, forgot my password kind of thing, you know, so forgot password, and then you should be able to reset your password to be able to get into your account. And uh, send a message, you know, to to send a support request form as well. All right, um, all right. So we have a question. Uh, I've had that since ten point five on Windows. Uh, this is from Lawrence Coke. Uh, Windows ten system tech support not been able to solve it. Force quit and third time. It's usually fine. I've done reinstalls. That not a wipe of Windows. Um, so. Uh, See if I missed your question, Lawrence, earlier. I'm not sure if I saw it. So maybe it got cut off if it was too long. Um, but if you want to send me an email to clubcubase at uh, steinberg.de, Lawrence, I'd be happy to try to see if I could help out. All right. Uh, we have to see a question. Uh, so what is the Zoom meetup all about? So it's just kind of a social hangout and pe you know get to know each other and stuff like that. So... It's usually a lot of fun. All right. Um, all right, so we have a question. Um, I have a friend in UK I want to collaborate with through VST Connect. I entered his Steinberg email attached to his account in order to find him and can't find him. Uh, is there a way to do it? So let's say if we come over to here, we'll go to your VST Connect Not sure if I've done it on this laptop, it's still new. All right, but I think so. Let's say if we Log in.
but there is a way where you could actually uh, just get a code from the person if you can't find their email. Let me see if. See if we can find it real quick before we migrate over. All right, so let's say if we come, let's see if, All right, so I think that there is a way. Um, let me see if we're. But I think that there is a way to kind of get the actual code if um, just having a brain cramp on it. Now, but but there is a way. Let me just. Um, but if you want to email me, because I know I'm just a little bit late for the Zoom, uh, email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de where I could show it on next Tuesday's live stream. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and start the Zoom meetup. Thanks for all the great questions. We hope that everyone has a safe weekend. Um, so let me go ahead and get Zoom started here. All right, so we have Brian Sawyer and Rich. Swicer. All right, Got more people joining in. And I'll go ahead and post the Zoom meetup credentials here. So we have Luca and Uno Memento. All right, we're just gonna hang on the actual live stream for just another minute or so longer, and then we'll I'll end the live stream. So again, uh, the meeting ID is a, uh, and this is live. So if you watch this like a week later, you know, it's probably not going to work. Uh, so if you're watching us live, it's 873-273-2103-7071. So 873-2103-7071. And the passcode is 230575. So once again, passcode 230575. All right. Well, they, just a moment. And I'm going to... See if we have more people coming in. All right, so we see Gerald, we have Graham, Nick, and Sable Winters. All right. All 
All right, so I see we're at 98 likes. Maybe we'll get two more likes if people are still on. All right, and we have Soren. Okay, so with this, I'm going to go ahead and end the the uh, the live stream, and everyone can migrate over to Zoom. All right, so I'm going to end the live stream.